All right, so next we are going to see subsets. And to start the discussion, let's consider these two sets. Let x be the set of all students in a school and y be the set of all students in a particular class of that school. Then we note one thing about these two sets, namely that every element of y is also an element of x. That's because if you take any student from y, that means from that particular class, that student of course is also a student in the school. Note that Every element of Y is also an element of X. And when this happens, we say that Y is a subset of X. So this is how the discussion starts and the actual formal definition comes now. There is a number also, although we are not paying too much attention to these numbers, but just for the sake of, um, I mean, just how it is given in the text, so I am also writing this. So it is definition 4. Let A and B, I am not writing these definitions and these discussions exactly as they appear in the text, okay. I am using my own language but basically the uh, notion is the same. Let A and B be sets. If every element of A is also an element of B, then A is called a subset of B and we write this symbol to express this fact, namely that A is a subset of B. Instead of saying that in words, you can just simply write this. And this is the symbol for the subset relation. It relates two sets. The one which lies on the closed end of this symbol, the set which lies on the, towards the closed end of this symbol is the subset and it is a subset of the set which lies on the other side towards the open end of the symbol. We also say that B is a 
superset in that same situation or to express that same uh, thing that A is a subset of B, that same statement, we also say that B is a superset of A. And we also write this. Okay, now some words about this symbol itself. This symbol has a name. symbol this denotes is a subset of this phrase or is contained in. So while reading this, we can also say A is a subset of B or A is contained in B. Whereas we have come across another symbol, right, already. For example, an element being an object small a being an element of a state capital A. When we read this we say A belongs to capital A, not contained in capital A. That's not how we usually read this statement. This statement, however, we read like this. A is contained in B. When we say that, we should understand that A is a subset of B. However, when we read this, we read A belongs to A, which means that A is inside A as an element. Now, something about how to remember the symbol. Remember the symbol means which set is the subset. It's a little difficult to remember that the set which lies at the closed end of the symbol is the subset. You can understand that a subset of another set is in some sense smaller than the set because it is inside the set. Every element in A needs to be in B, which means that A is in some sense inside B, not as an element itself, but as a part of B. A is like a single room in a house, whereas B is the entire house. So, we have similar relation among numbers between two numbers. For example, we know that 2 is less than 3. The natural number 2 is less than 3. Now, if you write just below this, this statement, it is also somewhat like this statement that A is smaller than B. Now look at these two symbols. This symbol is your usual less than relation between numbers where the smaller number lies at this end. The smaller number lies at the closed end of this symbol, this angle. And the larger number lies at the open end of this angle. This symbol is also somewhat like that. This is angular, this is more round. Okay, so that way you can remember which side you have to write the subset and which side you have to write the superset. 
and there is one more thing also the use of this symbol is not consistent in mathematics some people use another slightly different symbol to mean the same thing that a is a subset of b they would write like this just below this symbol they would put a horizontal bar those who use this symbol to mean the subset relation use this symbol to mean something else okay however we do, we do not have to worry about this because we are not going to use this symbol in this text for us when we want to say when we want to express that a set is a subset of another set we just use this symbol okay now let us investigate this subset relation a little more deeply when we express this sentence that every element of a is also in b how does it look thus if a is a subset of b then for every element a in a we have a also in b in other words we have this implication now we are all familiar with this symbol from mathematical logic however we often are confused with the real meaning of this symbol so let's digress a little bit and see just what it is okay what is the real meaning of this symbol and this symbol by the way is called implies so we are going to see not very deeply somewhat briefly what this implies even means now because we are going to talk about uh, mathematical logic so let us first be uh, clear about something what is a statement a statement is a sentence which is either true or false okay for example let me give you two examples minus 1 is a natural number this is a statement okay so say this is statement 1 another statement say is this 12 is greater than 2 yet another statement is say this and let me just write oh i should not perhaps uh, have said that these are statements because i am coming to that okay so these are sentences what is your name what a beautiful flower all of these are sentences some of them are of course not really that mathematical but we do have mathematical sentences as well now say we ask 
whether each of these sentences is true or false then the first sentence is false because minus 1 is not a natural number the second sentence is true the truth of the third sentence actually depends on the value of x if x is greater than 3 then the sentence is true otherwise it's false so it really depends on x but still for each chosen value of x the sentence is either true or false okay or false depending on x in case of the first two sentences we were able to immediately decide whether the sentences are true or false because they did not involve any variable they involved only constants that's why but of course we all already know that there are many sentences in fact it's the sentences with variables that we deal with uh, the most in mathematics but in all these three cases we were able to say for each instance of the variable whether that sentence is true or false however does it make sense to even ask uh, whether this one is true or false no what is your name it is i mean it does not even make sense to ask whether this is true or false so it does not come under that uh, i mean it it's not something like that similarly what a beautiful flower this is an expression an exclamation this also is neither true nor false so a statement is a sentence which is either true or false and of course not both and if the sentence has variable then for each choice of that variable for each fixed value of that variable the resulting sentence should either be true or false such sentences are called statements now this implies this this is the connective okay it links two statements one of them lies on this side the other one lies on that side now what is the meaning of this let's see suppose that p and q are two statements what they actually are that does not matter let p and q be two statements the moment we say statements the we know something about them namely that they are either true or false now let us draw a table of some values for p and q it will become clear what i am trying to do here soon so i need three columns in the first column on top i put p and in the second one i put q and in the third one i put this 
this statement or sentence, whatever it is. Now, in these cells, what I put are the truth values of each statement. Each statement has only two truth values in the kind of logic that we are dealing with. It is either true or false. If it is true, we write T like what we have written here. If it is false, we write F. So what are the possibilities? Both of them can be true. Both of them can be false. The first one can be false and the second one can be true. The first one can be true and the second one can be false. And when we say, let's see what the meaning of this symbol is, it means that this compound statement, a statement which has been formed using two other statements, P and Q, is a compound statement. Using this connective implies, we mean that we have to say precisely when this statement, this compound statement is true and when it is false. That will determine the meaning of this symbol implies. And the definition of this symbol is this. We declare this compound statement to be true when it, in the first case, okay. In the second case also, we declare it to be true. In the third case also, we declare it to be true. In the fourth case, however, we declare it to be false. Now, there should be some reason behind it. It's not an arbitrary choice. However, I'm not going to go into uh, the reason behind it, okay? That will be just going too deep. For now, we just take it for granted that this is the meaning of this symbol implies. And this is how a compound statement formed using this symbol uh, behaves, okay? In terms of being true or false. But at least let us see in uh, two cases why we have defined the table like this for this symbol. You see roughly what, what is it that we mean by implies? We mean of course implies is something which is meant to give us a statement from another statement so that if the starting statement is true then we expect the ending statement to also be true and that is why if the starting and the ending statements are both true then we declare the compound statement to also be true at the same time we also expect this implication to be false if the starting statement is true but the ending statement is false it's like this the logic behind it is like this you are starting with some true ingredients you are starting with a truth and then you do something to that so whatever you are doing is also okay then the end result should be true it should not be false so if the end result is false that means this implication is also false. A truth cannot imply falsity. That will be false. A truth always has to imply truth. That will be true. However, somewhat paradoxically or somewhat confusingly, we also define these two uh, situations for the implication. Namely, if we start from a false statement and whatever we end up with, whether that is false or true, we define the implication to be true. And these two instances have a name. In these cases, the implication is said to be vacuously true. Now, this is the source of confusion. 
some people may feel why do we need to define the implication to be true in these cases should it not be false because we are starting with false statements no that there are actual genuine reason for taking t and t here and that that's what i am not going to explain okay right now you are going to have to take my words for it that this is the most logical way of defining the meaning of this implies symbol in these two cases particularly these two cases are okay but these are a little confusing so whenever you are starting with a false statement and you are in an implication then you do not even have to look at the uh, ending statement whether it is true or false the implication is true and we say that it is vacuously true to indicate the fact that the premise on which our implication is based itself is false all right so with this understanding let us go back to that subset relation because we have just now seen that the fact that a is a subset of b can be expressed as an implication okay and i am going to keep this table here okay for some time so that we can see some things about this implication so a is a subset of b if this implies this oh by the way because i was talking about implication the starting statement has a name okay it is called the hypothesis of the implication and the ending statement also has a name it's called the conclusion of the implication there are other names also some people call this antecedent and this consequent okay so that means in this implication this is our hypothesis hypothesis is something which you start with and conclusion of course is conclusion what you draw after something has been done all right so for a to be a subset of b say two sets are given and you have been asked to show that a is a subset of b what is it that you have to do you have to prove that if a is an element of a then a is also an element of b note one thing that according to this definition showing that a is a subset of b means what showing that that implication is true which means that whenever your hypothesis that thing is true if a is an element of a then the conclusion must also be true that a is an element of b however if a is not an element of a then the hypothesis is false and in that case you actually do not have to do anything because in that case the implication is vacuously true these two cases however at the same time we also see something else a is not a subset of b when does this happen this is when that implication is false and an implication becomes false in only one case this last case where the hypothesis is true but the conclusion is false that means if this for some element a in a you should get at least one element in a which is not in b 
because that element will show you that the hypothesis of this implication is true but the conclusion is false and that's why the implication becomes false in i mean in, in general it's not true that means it's false so a is not a subset of b and that's why to show that a is not a subset of b you should be able to produce at least one element in a which is not in b okay all right so with this understanding now can we see that the empty set is a subset of a for every a every set a because uh, what is the corresponding expression as an implication in this case the hypothesis is false and that's why this implication is vacuously true all right so you don't even have to know whether the conclusion is or is not false it may be true it may be false we don't care it can be anything but the implication is true and that is why this statement is also true which just seems like simply uh, i mean this simply depends on the definition and we still don't know why we have defined the implication to be true in these two cases and simply giving it a name vacuously true we don't know that okay so but anyway if we agree to uh, use this anyhow then this statement is true however there is another way of looking at this suppose you say that no i don't believe you i am going to say that the empty set is not a subset of a for some set a say you forcefully you say no this is this is my statement now prove me wrong okay i will prove you wrong uh, like this what what have we seen here we have just now seen that for this to be true we should be able to find at least one element in the first set which is not in the second set now can you find an element a in the empty set such that a is not in a no because the empty set by definition has nothing in it so in particular no such element can be found which is why this statement is false so this must be true that way also you can look at this in fact um, that is easier to understand but anyway the fact is that the empty set is a subset of every set and because this statement is of course also trivially true so a is also a subset of a for any set a okay so next comes the possibility that not only is a a subset of b but at the same time b may also be a subset of a if a is a subset of b and b is a subset of a then every element of a is an element of b and also every element of b is an element of a so a and b 
consist of exactly the same elements that is a is equal to b so if both the sets are subsets of i mean each one of them is a subset of the other set then ultimately they are equal of course converse i mean the converse is also true if a is equal to b then a is a subset of b and b is a subset of a because of this okay because every element is a set of itself uh, i mean a subset of itself that's why we have this and this entire thing is expressed again logically like this so a is equal to b if and only if a is a subset of b and b is a subset of a and because of this reason if we are given two sets a and b and we are asked to show that they are equal we show that each one is a subset of the other and just like there is a table defining the meaning of that symbol implies there is a table that defines the meaning of this double implication or two way implication which is uh, the combination of two implications one on uh, this side and one towards that side i am not going to go into this you know very well its meaning this means that whenever okay this also connects two statements one on either side of the symbol it simply says that it is true if and only if either the two statements on its either side are both true or both false if one of them is true and one of them is false then this double implication is false this also is sometimes called if and only if and that is written in short like this i double if you already know about this things okay so i am not going to go too deep into this and now let us see some examples the set of rational numbers is a subset of the set of real numbers because every rational number is also a real number number 2 if a is the set of all divisors of any number we can give but uh, here 56 for some reason if a is the set of all divisors of 56 and b is the set of all prime divisors of 56 then obviously b is a subset of a because prime divisors also are after all divisors the number 3 if 
A is having these three numbers. 1, 3 and 5 and B is given in set builder notation is the set of all elements x such that x is an odd natural number. less than 6 then actually A is a subset of B and also B is a subset of A and in fact that is why they are equal and that's because these are precisely the odd natural numbers less than 6. Then there is one more. If A is the set of all the vowels in the English alphabet, small and B instead consists of these letters A, B, C and D. Then A is not a subset of B. Remember how we, uh, I mean what we decided on in order to show this type of thing. Namely, we have to show that there is at least one element in A which is not in B. Such an element you can choose O or U. These elements in A are not present in B. So A is not a subset of B. But similarly, B is also not a subset of A. Because for example, C is not there in A. D is not there in A, B is not there in A. These are consonants, these are not vowels. Okay, so this is another example. All right, and now we come to the strict version, strict version of the subset relation. If A is a subset of B and A is not equal to B. That may happen. In fact, we have already come across one such example, but we did not uh, look at it from this point of view. If A is a subset of B, but A is not equal to B as a set, then we say that A is a proper subset of B. I need some ink before I can continue further. In this case, A is called a proper subset of B. And those people who use that other symbol to denote the subset relation where uh, be just below our symbol there is a horizontal part. They use this symbol to denote proper subset.
we say that A is a proper subset of B. In this text, however, uh, no symbol has been assigned to express the statement that A is a proper subset of B. But there is one symbol, though. Uh, I mean, uh, which goes along with this one. Let me just write that and we write this. We put a horizontal bar below the below our subset symbol, but then strike it out. Only that bar, okay, not the entire thing. When you strike out the entire symbol, subset symbol, it means that A is not a subset of B, okay, which we have already used. But this is something else. We only strike that uh, horizontal bar. This means that A is a subset of B, but is not equal to B. That not equal to B part is shown like that. So actually, the subset relation, when you think about the corresponding relation for numbers, is like this. Okay. And proper subset relation is like the strict version of it. That's why I was saying just now the strict version of the subset relation. We also say that B is a proper superset and right like this. These symbols, however, have not been used in this text. Keep that in mind. Examples are easy. Um, yeah, for example, This set is a proper subset of this set. How? First of all, A is a subset of B. And why is that so? Is every element of A also in B? Yes. 1, 2, and 3, these are the only elements of A, and they are already in B. But at the same time, A and B are not equal because of what? Because of this extra element 4 in B, which prevents B to also be a subset of A. And that is why we do not get both A subset of B and B subset of A, which is why A and B are not equal. In other words, for A to be a proper subset of B, A has to be a subset of B, but there should be at least something extra in B, which is not in A. That's the thing. If, I don't know whether we mentioned this fact while studying finite sets or not, but anyway, it's, it appears here in the text. If a set a has only one element in it, then it is called a single tongue set. For example,
this is a single transept okay now let us see some further examples example 9 consider these steps the empty set then a set a which consists of the natural numbers 1 and 3 then the set b which has 1 5 and 9 and there is another one c whose elements are 1 3 5 7 9 all the odd natural numbers less than 10 all right now insert so this example is more like a question actually a problem insert the symbol the subset symbol or the not a subset of symbol between each pair each of the following pairs of steps First between the empty set and B, then between A and B, then the third one is between A and C, and there is another one between B and C. Okay. Now, we won't write much okay you can write a formal solution it's in fact available in the text but let's just see what the things are actually we already know that the empty set is a subset of every set so yes here we are going to put the subset symbol then what about a and b is a a subset of b let's see if every element of a is in b one is in b but 3 is not in B. Because of that, A is not a subset of B. What about A and C? Yes, every element of A is also in C. Both 1 and 3 are in C. So A is a subset of C. What about B and C? Yes, 1, 5 and 9, all of them are present in C. So B is also a subset of C. Next example 10. Here two sets are given. Let A be the set. Oh, so it, okay. So these are, uh, we have already considered them. A is the set of all the vowels in the English alphabet and B consists of the first four letters. Is A a subset of B? Oh, okay, there is no point writing these things. Is A a subset of B? No. Why? Because U, for example, is not there in B. So A is not a subset of B. Is B a subset of A? No. In fact, we have done this already. 
because for example d is not there in a so none of them is a subset of the other then there is one more example let a b and c b three sets if a belongs to b this may be a little confusing at first but we will see what it means okay and b is a subset of c is it true that a is a subset of c if not give an example well such examples which show that something claimed is not true are called counter examples well ideally i should write what is written in the text but we can actually produce many such sets the statement is not true okay here however these sets have been considered solution because it's a question there will be an answer take this and C equal to this. We may suddenly think that this is a wrong statement because when we have this belonging relation on this side of that relation, we have an element, not a set. But who said that an element itself cannot be a set? It can be. For example, here in this set B. one of the elements is 2 which is not a set but the other element is this single term set 1 which is a set so yes one set can be an element of another set there is no problem in that and now uh, so you just see here a is an element of b and b is a subset of c why is b a subset of c every element in b is also an element of c this set which is an element of b is again an element of c and 2 also is here so these two statements are true but a is not a subset of c why though is there an element in a which is not in c yes because one belongs to a in fact that is its only element and one does not belong to c again we may at first glance think that no one is there in c but one is in c in what state as what as nothing actually nothing that matters to us is one an element in c no C has three elements. One of them is two, the other is three, and the other is the singleton set one, not the number one. Okay, so that's why, as an element, one does not belong to C, in spite of the fact that you do see the symbol one when you write C in roster form. All right, and after all these things, I don't know why. 
but there is a statement which is completely wrong. It's given in the text. Let me just write the statement. Note this is what is written in the text. Note that an element, I don't know if it's a printing mistake or written deliberately of a set can never be a subset of itself. can never be a subset of itself wrong. This is nonsense. I am going to give an a set and an element in it which is a subset of itself. Consider the set. Let us, uh, okay, instead of taking some other set, let's take this B itself. The element this is the subset of itself. Because every set is a subset of itself. So what are they saying? I don't know the reason for this line appearing in this text, but it just shows how casual and how careless NCERT people are and they write books like this of this quality which has every possible type of error mathematical errors page numbers are wrong answers at the end of the book many of them are wrong they do not match with the question or uh, they got the answers mixed up in fact some answers are just flat out wrong there are silly grammatical mistakes, which are also not something, um, I mean, these are not small mistakes, okay? Some sentences don't even make sense. So this is the quality of NCERT books. But anyway, you, you just have to follow this because you do not have anything else. There are other books also, but these are government prescribed books. But anyway, this is where I am going to stop for tonight. We will see what comes after this. After this, you have subsets of the set of real numbers. There are, of course, many different types of subsets of R. But some particular subsets are more important than others. And we are going to see something about them in the next video. So that's just it, folks, for tonight. So see you in the next video. Until then, this is me, Lucifer from a mathematical group. Have a nice day.